Okay. I, I think I've gotten the audience I, I want back into the room, and that's lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, we, it, it's, it's, it's great that you're enjoying being together. Um, we always knew it is going to be a challenge to bring back people from the, from the coffee break. That's all good. We're here. We can um, restart the conference with our next panel. Uh, let me introduce the individuals who are on the stage. Kristaps Mors, a private investor. Kristaps, hello. Kristina Doroshko, a private investor as well. Hello, Kristina. Kristi Sare, founder of the Female Investors Club, visiting with us from Estonia. Kristi, hey. And Sari Launasmeri, CEO of Finnish Foundation for Share Promotion. Sari, hello. hello. And the moderator, Kaspar Spesnik, executive manager uh, of Latvia's Investor Club. Hello. Hello. So, um, before the panel begins and before Kaspar takes over as moderator, we will hear a, a presentation by Sari, and, and she's going to talk to us, uh, kind of kicking off the conversation that is going to follow on why are the Finns successful investors. Um, we, uh, so the, the allocated time slot is seven minutes. I'm, I'm not sure the story can be told in seven minutes um, because this is a success story that needs to be shared. But nevertheless, mm, please do uh, tell us that story. Sorry. Thank you so much. And thank you for the possibility to get to share the story with you. I'm fast, so you'll see we can do miracles in seven minutes. That, but what I wanted to tell you about is really the investment culture in Finland. First, I was to start about just showing you how many Finns invest, what we invest in and so on, and then go through some of the factors that I think are the success factors that have led to the fact that so many Finnish people are investing in the stock market. And then in the end, uh, like a graph to show you if that's actually been profitable and if it's been worthwhile for the Finns to do that. First, if we look at Finland, we have five and a half million people and out of whom more than 960,000 own shares directly in listed companies. So they themselves personally have invested, have shares in a listed company. And I think, of course, in Finland, when I talk about this, like I'm just like saying like we should have more, more people should have the possibility to become wealthier. We should have more individuals participating in financing the growth of companies. But of course, when you look at this, it's already a good amount. Almost a million people are shareholders in companies. And I think for a society that's also important because it means that you have really a lot of the people is, is really benefiting from the good work done by the companies and they are also the owners of the companies. And I think for a society to have the individuals be the owners in companies is very important. We see that one third of them are female and two thirds are male. So there's still something that we have to do. In terms of owning funds, that we have more Finns who own funds. The, of course, the figures are partially overlapping. We have more than one and a half million people who own funds. And there it's about 50-50 men and women who own those. In 2020, we got the opportunity to open equity savings accounts, which is an account where you have a certain tax benefit, meaning that within the account, you don't have to pay taxes until you take the money out. So there you can put money into the equity savings account. Inside, you can invest it into shares. If you get dividends, you don't ha you're not taxed immediately. If you sell something at the profit, you're not taxed only until later when you decide to take the money out. At that point, you pay the capital gains tax. This has really been a major signal for many people, especially for young people. Already more than 300,000 people have owned, uh, opened in the last three years an equity savings account, and majority of them are young people. We have a very, like the biggest group is people who are under 30 years old, like who have started investing in this way. They think that it's a very easy way to start. Now I have three slides of the reasons like, that I think have led to almost a million Finns wanting to own shares in listed companies. First, have to do with just 
trusting the market. I think that's hugely important. And actually, when we make little decisions, little steps, we have to think of how that would influence the whole trust into the market. Because trust is something that you build slowly, but you can lose it really fast, like just like reputation. And I think the fact that there is, like Verena Ross was here earlier speaking, I think ESMA national supervisors play, play a big role in building also that trust, that the individuals are trusting that this is something that they feel comfortable investing their hard-earned savings in into the capital markets. And I think also the rights of shareholders. When I look at later, I'll show you the graph, how the number of shareholders has increased, and you see that some of it matches very nicely with when they did these improvements to shareholder rights, that actually a minority shareholder has stronger rights that maybe that also makes people trust the market. The second set of reasons has to do with I think, like I see here, you have investor clubs, and I think having that community plays a big role in building that type of culture that then in Finland also, in, in the 70s, in, in 1980s, they started getting organized as shareholders association. And like then there are a lot of local shareholders associations, people meeting, and of course it was physical meetings. Then nowadays it's also social media groups. There's, for example, one Facebook group that discusses investment issues in Finnish that has more than 100,000 members that are participating in the discussion. And like that way, it's not only learning from home or those people who are near you, but you can actually find a lot of different people to talk about it, and that also makes people people feel more comfortable and get excited about investing. Also, just basic financial literacy in Finland. I, of course, would hope that we would teach much more things in schools, like that everybody would learn how to make an investment plan like when they are very young. But I still think that we have taken some steps to add financial literacy items into curriculum. And we also have a lot of volunteer programs. The foundation that I work for, we, for example, have a program where we are teaching high school students about saving and investing, and they then go in pairs to talk to ninth graders about these topics, kind of from young to young, that they can really, really understand each other and like get excited about the idea that because you have so many like you're so lured into consuming a lot but but so that you would also have the actually some good good people that you can look into that that are actually talking about saving and investing instead of just consuming all of your money and then the third is having the information and also having some sort of, for example, tax incentives. But if we talk about the inf information, already earlier it was mentioned that you can have corporate-sponsored research. That's what we have in Finland. So it means that when the companies are paying for the analysis, then it's really available and free for all. So every investor can have the analysis available without paying anything that where the companies are analyzed. And of course, it means that the company had to pay for it, but it means that it's like accessible for everybody. And then like you're probably as a company, more likely to reach really all individual shareholders or potential new shareholders. And that's how it has worked in Finland and what has helped a lot. That there is, you, you get information, you can acquaint yourself with that and you don't have to be a member of some sort of like private banking service or something, but like anybody can access that information. I already spoke about the equity savings accounts. I think taxation, we can see when we look at the number of investors, we see when the taxation has become made tighter, then there's basically the number gets lower and when you get some sort of tax incentives then Finnish people react very strongly towards that they think that okay now it's more beneficial for me to do this of course also investors want to have also companies to invest in so then when you have more IPOs you have more investors and when you have more investors you have more IPOs so that's kind of a beneficial cycle here I'll still show you the number of Finns as shareholders so starting from mid 1990s and you can see that there basically the fact that the, that it became more easily available, like you could invest with your computer, and also there were more IPOs, there was more talk about the market, there were increasing shareholder rights, that, that probably had an influence. And now, in the 2020, we can really see another jump ahead with the equity savings accounts, like, and also with all the social media discussions, like people getting more excited about the topic. Has it been beneficial for people? Has it been monetarily beneficial? Have they gotten something out of it? Here is a NASDAQ made international survey or comparison from for 55 years since 1966 to the end of 2021, comparing the markets showing like that Finland and Sweden where they the two top ones like this is cleared of inflation and there you see that that in Finland it has been beneficial because most people do invest in their home market even if of course in European Union we would like with the capital markets union that they would also invest into other countries so in that way it has been a good choice that people have done that 
Sorry. Tremendous. Uh, thank you for this snapshot of the Finnish experience. And I know this is a forum on the development of Latvian capital markets, but you made me wish to invest in, in the Finnish stock market. <laughs> I don't know whether that's the purpose of this event or not. But um, anyways, cross-pollination is always good uh, in any case. Nevertheless, thank you very much. And I, I, I myself developed a bunch of questions already that I will perhaps type into the Slido thing which is once again open. We've uh, moved along the previous questions, so it's a clean slate. Um, and, and, and any questions coming for this panel, please do log on to uh, Slido and, and join the conversation um, here. Having said that, um, Kaspers is the main uh, kind of uh, um, moderator uh, for this uh, here. Um, before I give you the floor, what is your main angle of attack, um, the way we can become more like the Finns here, or and by the way, uh, so Sadi mentioned I think three things: trust in the institutions, um, literacy, and also the legal infrastructure that comes to facilitate all of those things. So structural things. Is that going to be what you're going to you know base your conversation on? Yes, of course, it's uh, going to be part of it. All right. Um, Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Latvian Central Bank for organizing this uh, event. Uh, I, I um, feel a uh, great honor to be able to he uh, be here and uh, talk um, as a mirror or probably a projector of retail investor. It's not that uh, quite often uh, there is opportunity for a retail investor to tell his or hers uh, pain points about uh, markets uh, to such an influential uh, audience, right? Um, uh, we, we hear from you, what are your plans? What are you planning uh, to change? Where do you see the issues? But uh, maybe the little guy or girl is, uh, is having a different, um, uh, different pain points. For, first of all, I, second of all, I want to say, they <laughs> tell uh, thank you to to Sari for insightful presentation and uh, it's great to see the results of uh, how your investment culture and involvement have, have been growing. Uh, but uh, my main takeaway is that uh, there's still a room for growth, right? Definitely. I agree. Like, I, th I definitely think that there should be more. I, I would like a society where really everybody is involved, like not just thinking that you have to but I think many people still think you have to already be rich to start investing. I think it's the other way around, like just like start small little by little and like learn when you're doing. Totally agree with you. So what we're going to talk about today in this panel is uh, some, uh, I wouldn't call them exactly pain points, but some topics that uh, I think uh, are quite important uh, to help the capital markets to grow. Uh, we will start out with uh, looking at um, how and if the investment culture has changed uh, in the last few years and uh, can we do something with financial literacy. We will move on some uh, looking at some recent IPOs in Baltic countries. Have they been helpful or have, have there been a trap? Uh, we'll look, look into uh, uh, attitude towards uh, sustainable investments and uh, talk about ESG. And uh, then, of course, uh, there will be some suggestions for us uh, from us uh, to our uh, partners here, to government and, uh, and the regulators and, uh, and uh, big banks and other big players. Uh, what we can see that could be done uh, to, to, to promote financial markets and help them grow faster. I will probably kick off with a uh, short uh, thing that I just came to my mind uh, this morning when I was coming here. And uh, the, when, I, when we think about investment culture and investment literacy or financial literacy, uh, we always think about some, uh, at least I have a feeling that we think about some classrooms or uh, some lectures, some organized events. But then every night, at least every weeknight, we have a short segment on our national television where the lottery numbers are announced. <laughs> and then there's a one hour long uh, um, show on Sunday uh, for the super bingo where you can uh, win a car or, or uh, some money. And uh, what if we change this spot uh, from uh, lottery is a sure way statistically how to lose money, right? Long-term investors statistically 
earn money. I wouldn't say award win. They earn money statistically in the long term. So maybe first suggestion for everyone just to think about, maybe we switch off this uh, lottery and uh, turn on some uh, financial literacy uh, segments in our national TV and other media channels. And what if we don't spend 10, 10 euros per week on lottery, but we invest in uh, Baltic markets? I think uh, we would have a tremendous growth. But it's, I've been talking already for too long. Uh, looking at perspective of, uh, of investment culture and financial literacy, um, from Latvian side, we're always uh, compare ourselves to Estonians. And uh, in, the in the field of investment culture, I believe we are few or maybe a bit more years behind Estonia. And uh, that's why I'm very grateful that today on our stage is uh, Christy, who is, uh, I'm not afraid to say, uh, one of the most influential uh, investors uh, in, in Estonia. And uh, um, I assume you have, you, you have seen uh, expon exp exp exponential growth uh, in, uh, in investment culture in the last few years. Uh, could you please tell us more about that and what would be the main reasons for that in your view? <coughs> okay, hello everyone. Um, so uh, behind exponential growth is always years and years of work that uh, in the end uh, appears to be uh, sudden. So we started building the investment community in Estonia about 10 years ago or so. Um, and we started small. We had uh, regular retail investors who shared their experience in their blogs, in podcasts. They started Facebook groups, this kind of community building. Um, we had people working separately. Um, over time, different organizations kind of uh, helped. We had um, uh, banks, uh, we had the uh, Ministry of uh, Finance um, um, help organize events, uh, free events quite often uh, to help share this information to get people more interested as Ari said with the idea that you can start investing even if you don't have a lot of money, you don't necessarily have to be rich. Um, definitely um, the fact that technology has advanced so much has made it a lot easier. I mean when in the 90s you had to actually call the stock market to make purchases then nowadays you could just open up your phone app and you can make the purchase in 30 seconds. Uh, very very simple. Um, and this is the thing with uh, building this investment uh, culture that um, money for people is a very sensitive topic. Um, I'm sure it's the same in Latvian, but in Estonian we've had to work a lot um, to get people to be comfortable uh, when it comes to talking about money, about savings, about investments. Um, and for a lot of people, uh, what they say that what has made them investors in the end is that throughout the years they have had several different contact points with information about financial markets that has finally given them the courage to take the plunge and to actually do something. That they've read something in the media, uh, their bank has organized an event, there have been retail events, they've seen something on TV, and it takes a while for people to understand that, oh, this is something that is actually for us. Um, so where we're at right now in Estonia is that we just celebrated that we now have um, 100,000 uh, um, accounts for people who own shares in the Baltic market, which is uh, uh, growth in multiples when it comes uh, to what we started with um, 10 years ago. Uh, but as I said, this has been 10 years in the making, so I'm uh, quite sure that Latvia will be in the same situation in just, just a couple of short years. I hope so. I hope so. I know Christoph has been uh, very active in, uh, in, in trying to promote investments and uh, he has been trying different kinds of formats, blogs, uh, videos, podcasts and, 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 and all kinds of formats and he's an active investor himself and he's not afraid to share uh, his uh, wins and losses. Uh, but how do you see, by judging from your uh, audience, uh, has the investment culture changed in the last few years? Uh, is there improvement in investment literacy? Or, uh... Uh, I'm a bit skeptical uh, because uh, critical thinking is really missing. Uh, people see uh, really nice promises about high returns and, and that's it. Everything else is uh, forgotten about. Uh, and uh, the way too many people, I think, learn in Latvia about investing is uh, by losing money in different kind of frauds and scams. And uh, I think that's maybe not the best way how to do it. Uh, and uh, part of it 
could be uh, because of, of lack of education. So I don't think in, in schools we, we have any kind of classes about it, like, like in Finland. Um, but uh, maybe there's also some part that, let's say, our regulators could help. Uh, there were, at least in the last couple of years, at least uh, 10 different kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer investing uh, scam uh, platforms, uh, both in Latvia and Estonia as well, uh, that, uh, that resulted in tens of millions of, of money lost. Basically, it's uh, capital destruction and, and, and loss of trust. Uh, and, and this is the way how uh, too many people uh, educate themselves by losing money. And uh, uh, I think that uh, if there would be more stricter regulation or someone would actually care about this, uh, these, these schemes could be shut down uh, faster. And not when they explode themselves, but uh, actually when someone reports them or when it's basically k kind of uh, quite clear that this is uh, not something investable. This is just uh, another uh, Ponzi scheme. Yeah, yeah. This is a truly topical uh, problem. Of course, not only here in Latvia, we uh, yeah, retail investors, and not only retail investors, are uh, also tired in some other countries with the regulators uh, of uh, being, let's say, uh, uh, looking at the body afterwards mm. <laughs> and uh, dealing with the consequences uh, not uh, helping to um, in a process before the happening um, sorry what's the situation in Finland do you have the same uh, issues with the let's say uh, some peer-to-peer -peer scams or or, uh, or or the situation is better there I think like some years ago there have been like some pyramid uh, type of structures that have been scams but like recently like Fortunately, none have have surfaced, but like I, I do recognize the problem, and I think like there it is very important because like often the investor can't really separate between what is regulated market and what is something that they maybe should have understood that this is like just a scam that it's it's nothing, and I think that's somehow also important is like to and then I guess like that, that we could somehow teach people to ask us like certain basic questions such as if someone is telling you that there is like high reward and no risk that then basically like everybody in elementary school should learn that like no that's not possible like that like someone has to be able to tell you ab about the risk and rewards like both of them like so yeah like I agree that that is a big problem and also the fact that later then like maybe the guilty people are thrown to jail or something but the investors never get back their money so that's also a problem. Yeah, I think the biggest risk for this is that uh, we may lose these investors as yeah. we have seen in Latvia with the with the companies uh, let's say with previous generations uh, who have been investing money during times of privatization and uh, for a lot, a lot of them it was very bad experience to invest in, uh, in stock markets uh, because uh, you had uh, you weren't taken care of uh, of big shareholders and uh, you always fe feel not too well about your investments but this is changing this is changing and this is the good thing and maybe to turn on a bit of positive side uh, last few years uh, we have seen uh, several new IPOs uh, let's say new generation companies coming in uh, who are more active and uh, and uh, more uh, open to their uh, minority shareholders um, and we have seen several of them in, uh, in Latvia as well um, and uh, how do we see them? Have they, have they been uh, su in, successful to bring in new investors or uh, they have been, let's say, investment trap? Maybe we can start with uh, Christy from, uh, from Estonia. I know you have a lot of ex IPOs in the last few years. Uh, yeah, uh, we can very clearly see that whenever there is a new IPO, there is an uptick in the amount of people who start investing. Just because every new IPO, it gets media attention and uh, your friends are investing and they mention it and then you want to invest as well. Um, now, the issue clearly is what types of IPOs do we get? So, uh, the Baltic stock market list is, is rather small um, and clearly people, especially ones who are less experienced, they would like to see uh, bigger and more established companies um, in the markets. They would like to see uh, the states bring parts of um, state companies to the stock market uh, versus those very, very small uh, companies that are in their growth phase that come to, uh, like, I don't know, First North uh, and they're like, we want to raise 500,000 euros and we are very, very super high risk. So people's experiences have varied. Uh, those that invested into 
every single IPO in the past two years are uh, probably very solidly in the red. <laughs> um, but um, uh, as Christoph uh, said, a lot of people, that is how they learn that you make decisions and you lose money. And that is, to some extent, inevitable. We can't expect every IPO to be successful because that's just not how the economy works. There are risks, which means that they sometimes do realize. Um, and um, I, I think the main thing with the IPOs that has truly helped, uh, and I see a lot of companies doing this well, is that when they have an IPO, then the kind of roadshow that follows it, that they go to the media, they try to talk to retail investors at different events, that this all helps raise both awareness and the actual level of knowledge that investors have, that when you have this prospectus that's 200 pages, then trust me, retail investors do not read this 200 page prospectus, uh, but they do look into the um, information that is kind of shared and simplified. So uh, I'm uh, very happy that there were so many IPOs. Uh, it's currently a bit quieter, um, but I believe that we will, um, um, we will get back to a regular pace uh, once the economy recovers a bit. But, uh, would you agree that, uh, I think we have established that already, but uh, do you see some, let's say, some companies that you can mention in the last few years who have brought in like a waves of new investors. Uh, uh, for Estonians, clearly, when uh, NFIT Green came to the market, then everyone and their grandmother created an investment account, pretty much. Uh, it, was, um, it was really that popular. Um, and I, I think that's a good thing. Like some people are like, what do you mean? Like people are investing without any experience. And I'm like, well, if you're starting investing without any experience, then the IPO of a big state company is a good place to start because for a lot of people the place where they start is an ad they see online or buying crypto or things like that um, so i would say there's um, uh, it's it's good to start off like that great uh, christoph do you participate in uh, in latvian ipos or baltic ipos and uh, how do you view them uh, mostly no I, I think i only participated in mother cosmetics uh, some years ago but uh, yeah, it's just very small market, very few companies, and uh, uh, I I liked uh, previously the comments made uh, that uh, maybe we will have these uh, Latvian state-owned companies uh, doing IPOs later, so th that would be uh, something more serious. And uh, but but overall, right now, I think uh, the liquidity is not there in uh, at least in Riga in, uh, in in the companies, and it's. But do you, as just a retail investor, as an individual investor, do you feel actually this uh, liquidity issue on yourself, or it's just a mantra that we? No, no, no. It's it's that's my experience because uh, when I wanted to try to, try to sell uh, company shares of, of Madara, and that was, I, I think I had maybe 10k or I, I don't know, a couple of thousand. So it wasn't a, a large amount. Uh, I had to place sell orders uh, and change them uh, several days uh, because my my small orders actually influence the price. So it's ridiculous that I, I'm trying to, to sell a couple of shares and now the price has gone and, and the daily volume is, is, is nothing. So it's... Uh, so we can agree, uh, as with previous panel, that liquidity is also an issue and that it is not an issue only for, uh, for uh, large institutional investors, but it's also for uh, Yeah, yeah, it's so, it's so bad that uh, even if you're a small retail investor, it's, it's just, yeah. Okay, and would it help you to, to come back uh, to, to see more, uh, to participate more in Baltic markets if there uh, would be more liquidity? Yeah, of, of course, and uh, I think that's the viewpoint of, of many uh, investors, at least those who might want to invest a bit more money than, than several hundred euros, because for, for maybe for that amount of size it's enough, but uh, if you invest larger sums then... Okay, we need several thousands of those lottery win players, so if they start <laughs> yeah. to invest a few tens of euros per month, uh, then we get... But, but also much more listings and much more companies, because yeah. it's... Yeah. And do you have the same problem with liquidity, uh, Sari, in uh, F uh, Finland? Uh, with new companies coming into the market or it, you have them so large, you are doing everything so good that it, <laughs> you don't think about that? 
Now, of course, m most uh, most uh, retail investors invest in the large companies, like so then they don't have that problem. But like in, in terms of numbers, like many of the companies are small companies. In Finland, the small cap is considered companies that world market value is, is less than 150 million euros. But there, you do have often a large owner that already is holding a certain position that they don't trade, and like maybe some other also like holdings that don't really change owners. So in that way, yes, definitely in the smaller companies, you do have that liquidity problem that you run into if you have invested even a little bit more and you want to get out of it right away, then you are there, like 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 you were describing, like they're sitting a week or two, like trying to sell those without influencing the price. So so yes, that, that is an issue. And I think that's something that then it means that like, really when there's been discussion and question, like should we, like should it be allowed like that the free float amount would be even smaller? I think no, I think, I think like it depends of course on the size of the company, but for the smaller companies, that would be a problem. And I think that's something because we are telling investors that like, oh, this is wonderful, you just put in your money. And like, as opposed to if you were owning something like, like a home or like an apartment or something like where you need to wait a long time to sell it, like with the shares, like you just like click the button and like then two days later, like there the money comes like, and then if people realize that that's not true, that's a problem. Like, so yes, I think liquidity is important. Yes, it, it, it would be good if we can buy stocks in IPO and then not hold them until the maturity, right? <laughs> stocks until the maturity. I hope someone understood the joke, but uh, if not, I'm sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, moving, uh, moving, um, moving on, uh, there's one topic that uh, cannot be not discussed on, on any uh, panel uh, when you talk about investments, and that is uh, sustainable investments and, uh, and ESG. And uh, for that, uh, uh, I'm very happy that on our panel is Christine, uh, who is an ESG expert. And uh, and uh, how do you see how how have been we doing with uh, with sustainable investments here in Latvia? And maybe give us a broader view of uh, from your side. Oh well, uh, in Latvia, I think uh, the understanding of sustainable investments is still rather a niche thing. Uh, I think. In general, maybe finance, retail investors are not ready to jump in in sustainable investing. Me personally, I'm a big fan of impact investing, but of course, I won't make any change. But uh, bigger funds and investors, of course, they can do. And um, so, yeah, for our local um, population in Baltics, it's it's a niche. But if we look uh, at the pension funds or, uh, well, uh, the plans how to retire. So according to some studies of the local banks in, in Baltics, people wish that their money are invested sustainably. So around 60% of people are willing that their money uh, is invested sustainably. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of critics of ESG. And if we can now open the debate, uh, I think we can yeah, end up very badly. But um, I believe in, if you invest in sustainable company, you can be sure that this company will survive. Uh, it's, it, it has assessed, in, in best case scenario, it has uh, assessed the climate risks. It's ready to face them. And it has done some homework. So I would rather trust this type of company rather than the one who doesn't care about ESG. So that's my point of view. And looking at the recent years of uh, IPOs here in Latvia as well, how have they been doing in the ESG field? Um, since I invest only in sustainable companies, uh, Enifit Green is uh, one of the leaders, and I think it's uh, until now in Latvia one of the uh, best, uh, let's say, return uh, of investment that has uh, given us. And uh, then some other companies, uh, I'm a big fan of Auga Group or uh, Madra Cosmetics, that are companies that you see abroad that they are not going to struggle how to export their products in Western uh, Europe or in Scandinavia. So, yeah, we can question the returns, except and if it's green, but overall, I think since sustainable investments is something uh, long term, you you see it as a long term perspective. I think we will have some returns in 10, 15 years. Great.
Yes, it's turned on. Thank you. Uh, apologies for uh, chipping in here, but well, there are tons of questions. I was just, uh, I was just um, concerned that we ran out of time in the previous panel, uh, but there are you know, tens and tens of questions from, I assume, private investors who are, uh, you know, um, uh, amazed by this conversation, by an opportunity to discuss these things in a, in a, in a larger setting. So we will try to. Uh, Yes, project them on the screen as well, but uh, Kaspers, you, you got them, oh, right? Yes. Correct. Yes, so uh, as Kaspers goes over those questions and tries to think who uh, couldn't be addressed to whom, um, let me take uh, once again a quick temperature uh, of, the, uh, of the room here. So we had a question, um, can, if we could project that on the screen, the quick poll uh, once again. Um, can we... Can we see it? Can we switch to it, please? Yes, we can. So, um, the question we wanted to ask you, um, and if you could be so kind and get engaged in this, did the capital market professionals and regulators get the pain points of retail investors? What is your impression? Do the responsible authorities and you know investment professionals get what hurts the retail investors in Latvia, why they're not sufficiently active. Is there a disconnect between the, uh, the authorities and retail connect, uh, uh, investors? What is your opinion here? Um, we've got four answers, uh, possible answers here. Yes, no, not yet. They will watch again video replay of the panel, and these aren't the real pain points of capital markets growth. All right, um, keep on voting on this. We'll, we'll, we might reflect at the end of it uh, what's the, what, and make sense of uh, what, what, is, what is the idea, uh, average idea here in the room uh, on that question. Uh, nevertheless, so this is taking place and the questions are yours and you've got 20 minutes still left. Please, Kaspers. Yes. Oh, back to you. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks for that. And uh, I see from the results that uh, I have to give uh, give, uh, give some summary at the end uh, what could probably be the pain points. And so you actually can watch the video again afterwards and uh, see them. Um, uh, here are some questions, but I will get back to them in a while, in a, in a bit. I wanted to to finish with the. Uh, if it's possible to finish with the ESG topic, it's not possible to finish. We're just starting out, right, in the global investment scene uh, with the ESG investments. And we got a viewpoint from Christine. Uh, Christoph, I know you're a bit skeptical, and uh, maybe it is a uh, nice words to say, uh, use the word skeptical, but uh, how do you see it? And does the retail investor, let's say you, or investors who are following you, or uh, you're communicating with them, with them, do they care about ESG at all? No, uh, I think it's mostly a distraction. And uh, in some cases or industries, it, it can also lead to actually worse results because uh, let's say if you have a really highly competitive in industry where, where, where companies uh, have, have to really care about their margins, uh, and then there will be one company that, that so it says that okay let's be investor friendly let's let's uh, have good pr let's be esg compliant whatever uh it can lead to to worse uh, returns in the end so i think companies should focus on 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 uh, what they do and uh, on efficiency productivity and uh, if it at the same time also uh, kind of connects with these issues that's good but uh, that's not what what companies should be thinking about in their daily operations. So if you want to make, uh, I don't know, the world a better place and uh, reduce greenhouse gases and, and so on, uh, uh, I think that should be done at a different level. So maybe burn less coal or uh, set up a couple of nuclear uh, power stations. But uh, uh, I, I don't think it's the the company level or personal level, like, uh, I don't know, talking about some uh, taxes, carbon taxes on, on individual consumption. I think it's all just ridiculous, so. Okay, uh, got your point. Uh, Christy, uh, how do you feel if it's a push coming more from the above, from, let's say, regulators, market players, uh, institutions, and uh, is there a 
pull uh, from uh, below uh, or uh, from uh, from retail investors are they actually I'm asking for it um, I mean if you ask a question do you want your money to be used for good I mean people won't say no I want my money to be used to pollute and make the world the worst place now the practical side of this is for a retail investor ESG is an ecosystem issue because a retail investor does not have the knowledge or the resources to do that level of analysis to actually understand is my investment ESG certified because there's like a million different ways to actually analyze it. So what the retail investor mostly gets is um, ESG investments in their portfolio tend to be like coincidences <laughs> in the sense that you are invested, for example, in Estonia you are invested in the pension funds and pretty much all of the pension funds have an ESG filter on it. So that you are invested in the pension funds, you would be invested in them even if they weren't ESG certified, but now that the regulation has come down that they should be, then they are. Um, and this is the thing, we can see that there is expectation in the markets. I mean, Estonia has this um, startup, Grünfin, for example, that offers only green investments. But the service that they actually offer you is the fact that we will do the analysis for you so that you can actually be confident that the investment is green. Um, and this is the thing that for a retail investor to take ESG into consideration, it is just technically very, very difficult. Um, I disagree with Christoph in the sense that it's not something that's done at the individual level. It definitely is. It's not just done on the investor level. It's done on the consumer level. Because if we want companies to be more ESG oriented, then consumers dictate the market. Um, the money is always there. There's always someone who is willing to invest into companies that have nothing to do with ESG and do morally questionable things. Um, but this is something that essentially regulators kind of look over because retail investors do not have the strength to impact the market in such a way to uh, make a company be more ESG compliant. I completely agree with you. Even for me, as I'm a sustainability professional, I don't trust ratings anymore. I don't trust um, ESG reports, but I have to really analyze fund by fund. Uh, first slap in my face I received when I was uh, willing to uh, put my money in ESG fund, in ETF. And uh, then I see that the bunch of companies that I'm really uh, not in line with, like, uh, for example, big oil and gas companies, which are still drilling, still uh, doing the same thing. And uh, so then I realized, OK, I really need to analyze fund by fund, company by company. And this is with like my specific knowledge. So I think on average, like average consumer, it's, it's impossible to filtrate those like really sustainable companies. Mm. You really need to get some advice. Yeah, that's the trouble with that. And uh, how is it in Finland? Uh, does the, is, is the retail investor asking for it? Or uh, is it the same thing? ESG from above, uh, we put a mark on it, ESG, and uh, charge a bit more, and <laughs> it's okay. Based on the surveys, we noticed that, the, that especially young investors and especially women are interested in ESG. And actually, it means that, like, that the fact that there is more availability and more talk about ESG investments actually is, is getting people who didn't used to be interested in investing at all, that they thought that investing was something like that, like it's just not for them, like they, that, that actually makes them interested in investing. And I think as such, it's already a very good topic. Then comes the problem that if you're just like selling funds with like pictures of cute baby polar pairs and people are thinking like, oh, they're saving the planet. And then like, and then if they find out that that's not true, then like, I think they're going to lose faith in the market. And I think that's why it's very important that there is really regulation of like what is green and what can be sold and marketed as such so that people don't get disappointed. I think there is, so I think, yes, that there is like coming from investors interest in investing in sustainable targets, but also I think many people are also invested in like maybe impact investing, like you said, or like also kind of transition really companies like in Finland, we have like Nestor, an oil company that were still most of our energy comes from oil, but they start, they've started doing like this, like biodegradable fuel and whatnot. So people are like, okay, like this is black, but it's kind of turning towards like green or SSAB, like a steel company trying to make steel in a way that wouldn't cause because like construction like has all those like carbon dioxide 
like emissions, like so trying to do it like without those or, or like having a new plant, like changing how they are doing things. So I think people are also kind of interested in the change. And when we see that a lot of the pension money and a lot of the big institutional money is flowing into these, like then probably if an, if as an individual investor, you can find kind of a target that's like really at the moment doesn't fit the ESG criteria, but like you can see that there's a transition happening. I think like maybe we also fit Christoph's criteria that it's going to be something that it's going to be actually also financially beneficial. Yeah, and to mix up, mix up our, uh, our, our panel, um, we have a question from, uh, from audience. Uh, what information you, each of us as an, as an investor, uh, we read before investing? And I think we can tell uh, now that the re responsible <laughs> parties here, what information do we actually read when we make investments? And uh, here are some examples, prospectus, uh, key information uh, documents, uh, ESG reports. Uh, maybe let's just, just go uh, through ourselves and uh, let's start with Christophs and then uh, what do you read when you make investments? I guess it depends on the product. Uh, let's say if it's an IPO, you can read this uh, prospectus and uh, there I would start with valuation at first and uh, the rest is almost like uh, I would ignore. Uh, so you don't read uh, prospectus? Or no, read I, I read it, but okay. I read like certain parts of it. Uh, I, I would certainly skip the ESG part. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if, if you touch more exotic uh, things like, I don't know, crypto, so there is no prospectus there or uh, let's say uh, different kind of stocks or, or uh, ETFs. Uh, uh, that are already trading in the market, then then you just also maybe I, I try to look at uh, what, what historically has been happening there, uh, what I expect in future to happen, and, and read some news and, and research and stuff like that. But uh, it, it depends really. Thank you, Christy. Um, I probably read most of the information that's available, but that's not representative of a typical retail investor. I do this because I know that someone will call me and ask me for my comment on it. Um, the average retail investor does not read the prospectus for IPOs. They generally don't even read the shortened summary. Um, they read the expert comments that are put out in the media. Um, and this is something to consider in the sense that for most retail investors, their decision making is somewhat crowd based. Um, in Estonia, for example, uh, we have this um, um, newspaper Aribab that has this imaginary investor, Investor Thomas, that is investing real money. And whenever there's a new IPO, he gives an opinion. Will I invest or will I not? And there's a very large amount of people who base their investment decision on the fact that Thomas said that he is investing. Uh, so this is uh, something to consider as well, that uh, the level of analysis, some of it is, of course, corporate paid analysis that people can read, uh, but having more um, independent experts who share their thoughts and take out from the prospectus and the analysis, um, this is what helps most retail investors uh, make decisions, because even if they read the ESG uh, part, which Christophs uh, doesn't, uh, then as a retail investor, actually understanding what the written down information means or how to kind of place it in terms of the market. Um, that is the difficult part. So again, the community is very important, right? Yes, the community. Okay, and availability of, uh, of research uh, coverage, uh, just, just putting in the topic. Uh... It is getting better. It is getting better. I mean, like uh, maybe even five years ago when IPOs came out, you had like one or two um, analysis in the newspapers. But now from like the Estonian side, we have when there's an IPO, there's at least five to ten known retail investors who write out their own analysis. There's like, I don't know, inside um, uh, in light research and like uh, corporate sponsored research that offers alternative options. So you actually get to have multiple points of view from people who are not always um, um, incentivized financially to write well about the company, but they are free to write critically about it as well. And does the retail investor care about that uh, these are sponsored research or they don't understand it? Um, that depends. Um, uh, quite often, I think that it should be more clearly communicated uh, if it is sponsored. But I think it's one of the issues with uh, current media as well, that to understand what is actual 
uh, content and what is uh, well um, uh, hidden advertising is kind of rather difficult. But I mean, for example, one of the things that we've uh, uh, requested Arivav to do as well, for example, if they uh, take a comment from someone about some sort of stock position, then it uh, always has to be actually uh, uh, shared the information of whether or not they own a position in this investment as well, or are they tied to it in some way, uh, which builds trust and clarity and kind of transparency that if you have a person who owns a position in the company saying that, oh, I think this is a good investment, they might be right, but they also do have a personal stake in this company doing well. Great. Uh, Christine, what do, you, what do you read when you make the ESG section? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, for me, first of all, the room of maneuver is very narrow because I follow those companies and funds um, that are in line with the, like, uh, what are the global trends. Uh, for example, I believe in sustainable food companies, uh, renewables and so on. So it's already like by this um, criteria following the mega trends, I'm already narrowing down the, the where I can invest my money. And then of course I check the basic uh, balance sheets of what is the performance of the company, uh, what is the yeah, performance of this fund uh, in, in general in, in the stock market. And, uh, and then it comes the, yeah, how serious they are about their climate or sustainability commitments. Are they climate neutral company? Have they declared something officially or not? And yeah, so are they serious about their commitments and what's the vision for the future? So those are the main things. Great. Sorry, what is a typical Finnish investor uh, looking at when they're making investments? Uh, do they also rely on analysis by experts or comments or uh, they dig into prospectus and, uh, and talk with the, their family at the dinner table or that's just reserved for crypto? There was a large survey and like, people were asked, like, who do you ask for advice in terms of investments? And they had choices like such as the bank advisors or your family members or friends. Or and the most common answer was the experts of the internet. So it's kind of the same that was said here. Is that, that people really do listen to the influencers and like discussion groups. I do think that they don't just take one source. I think that they compare that there is like with an IPO, there are several people writing their analyses and like maybe that's causing discussion. Like, so I think in a way, maybe Maybe that's a good way, but it's also good to know that it's not some sort of official source and it's not necessarily, I think it's good that it doesn't have to be everybody doing their own analysis because I think investing is supposed to be something that's easy, that accessible for all, everybody can do it. But I think that's important to know that it, it is the experts of the internet who are the ones like that people get their information from. Yeah, and uh, we already established that uh, a huge stepping stone for developing uh, capital markets is, uh, is uh, huge IPOs and success stories in stock markets as with uh, NF NFA Green in Estonia. And here's a, qu a question from audience. Uh, how big is the uh, Nokia effect in uh, developing investment culture in Finland in the 90s? Yeah, so I think like when when you have like a share for Nokia was like first very successful and then then then, then not like so yes like like first if there is something that people are investing and it's like doing really well of course like then you tell like your taxi driver and your hairdresser and like they all want to get in on it on the other hand like if it doesn't go well then if people are not diversified then it's of course like not a positive ex experience but like yes I think definitely that there are companies that people know about that they kind of want to identify as a shareholder that you maybe know it as a consumer like maybe it's um, many people's employer and like and so on I think that is important like and it's like part of building the community and getting interesting in, in really that you want to be an owner in a certain company some people like Marimekko like a Finnish design company and they're like oh like super important that like I'm a shareholder and like they're proud of that so yeah yeah and, and one more uh, technical question about uh, your uh, equity savings account uh, maybe you can give us a short answer uh, is it uh, spe specifically only for shares in companies or you can have different kinds of investments in there Finland started with a very narrow model so you can only have either money there like or shares in listed companies so no other financial instruments I know that for example in Sweden they have a lot of instruments there's been talk about that in Finland should we extend it but at the moment only shares in listed companies just individual stocks 
and local ones or whatever you no, want. No, it, it can be anything. Like so, that's that's not limited. But the tax benefit, like Finland, makes sure that like it like that it for sure applies to everything that's from Finland. But like I think they also mentioned today earlier about the the source taxation of dividends. Like so, if a foreign country takes something, then like Finland like doesn't like necessarily give it back to you. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. And um, as we are approaching the end of our panel. Uh, I would like this opportunity for, for each of us to give us uh, some kind of ideas or, uh, or our, uh, let's say, short feedback uh, to government and regulators and all, uh, let's say, uh, very important parties attending this event. Uh, what could be done, uh, say, more, better or differently to improve the markets? And uh, maybe, Christine, we can start with you. Do you have some ideas? Uh, yes, definitely. I'm worried about our small, medium enterprises here that they are, I think, not prepared or also large companies. They are not prepared to face all the regulatory uh, challenges that they are going to face in, in terms of uh, yeah, uh, carbon uh, legislation that is upcoming. So to prepare them, to give them understanding how actually to make the reports and how actually to to manage the company so that it's sustainable uh, and uh, it's also appealing to customers and to foreign investors and also local investors. So, yeah, because legislation is press, pre, pre, pressing and, and they need to be prepared. And the same applies to the banks, that they need to prepare those companies and the companies that are applying for going public, they, they need to have their, uh, yeah, um, how to say, the basics, the the, the the issues correct and uh, ready, so help and ready to face. So help and guidance going through all this. Uh, exactly, and, uh, workshops and, 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 and so on. Okay, great. Uh, Christy, something to add? Um, well, I won't emphasize the basics of the fact that you need to educate people and deal with them. And uh, uh, this is something that I've seen like with bigger market participants. I understand that retail investors are a bit annoying to deal with because they don't have a lot of money and they ask a lot of questions and, um, and they don't have the knowledge to understand the risks very well. It's, it's a work in progress, but I mean, for actually building wealth of a country, you need to have this retail investor base. So you kind of need to help them to get better at it. I think one of the issues we have with regulation overall is we've, um, we've created a very interesting situation where for a retail investor, there is a lot of friction uh, to start investing. If you want to invest into the stock market, you have to do, uh, I don't know, some quiz in your bank whether or not you're smart enough to actually invest. And there's like an AML check and there's like a lot of friction. While with like a random crypto website, you just transfer money there and you're an investor. Um, and the problem is, as Christoph said, like this is the site that should be more regulated and everyone's kind of just like not touching it. Um, and we've created this situation where a lot of people who want to start investing, they are so intimidated by everything that comes with investing into regulated markets that it's just so much easier to transfer your money somewhere to a website <laughs> online. Uh, so this is something to take into consideration that since there is such a barrier um, that you need to kind of educate people to understand that this is a manifestation of trust, that the fact that there is regulation means that you can be, uh, you can feel more confident uh, placing your money there, uh, that uh, this actual friction there is there to protect you and uh, give you confidence that the system um, is good. Um, and overall, I would say, um, in, in the Baltics, our investor country, I mean, we're doing good. We just literally had 50 years of no capitalism. Um, and while we are very tempted to compare ourselves to Scandinavian countries as well as we do in Estonia, um, I think it's just that we are playing catch up. Uh, that we don't have parents teaching our kids what investors are. Uh, we don't have parents buying their kids stocks uh, when they're born because they just did not know um, how to do it. Uh, so overall, I would say that we are on the right track, uh, but this broad-based education just literally needs all market participants to contribute because the community can't build itself without support from relevant organizations. Great. Christoph, do you have something to add very shortly? Uh, very short, yeah. I, I think the continuing uh, the same idea that it, it should be more easy to invest in, in stocks and uh, it should be more harder to invest in different kind of frauds. And uh, I think it's a bit ridiculous that uh, like every part of, uh, of of participants in this market, like regulators, police, like investors, everyone knows 
and is aware of different kind of like uh, crypto or, uh, or, or, or not even crypto or just uh, uh, simple investment frauds and uh, no one is doing anything like police is saying basically okay when we will have victims maybe we will act later uh, regulators are saying okay this is we, this is not our responsibility we, we do only like uh, some part but we don't uh, oversee uh, the whole market so uh, it, it seems that it shouldn't be like that so uh, and getting back to your example about this super bingo and, and this uh, gambling <laughs> stuff so uh, in Latvia I've seen several cases where uh, there have been illegal gambling sites and so these are competing with Latvian uh, Latloto uh, and they have been shut down quite fast so you don't pay the license, your website is shut down, and that's it. Uh, I don't see the same happening in, uh, in different kind of uh, investment frauds. So they keep uh, living their lives, attracting investors, uh, also getting attention of different kind of influencers, uh, and, and uh, I think that's not the way it should be. Okay, so to sum up our panel, uh, more information, uh, from, uh, from influencers, from commentators, less friction to trade in stocks, more friction to do, go into fraud, uh, more help with uh, uh, going through uh, regulations and helping with ESG. And uh, yeah, I think that's it, right? Or I'm missing something? Easy. 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 That's easy. <laughs> and then some governmental IPO, that's the easy fruit to pick. Uh, and uh, let's bring on some 10, 20,000 retail investors in, in Latvia with bringing this energy company to public markets. And then we can have a small victory uh, on our way. We will. Thank you to our panelists. Yeah. Cheers. And by the way, in the afternoon, our panels are uh, going to be you know, consisting of company representatives. So uh, that, that is going to be the continuation of this, this conversation. This panel had the most difficult task because they were the ones just before lunch. So uh, they did perfect. Uh, thank you very much. It was a great contribution that you made for our conference today. Um, it's, it's lunchtime now. Um, I will call you back in an hour, okay? You'll hear me, all right? <laughs> um, bon appétit, I'll see you in an hour, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.